Gonzalo was already fairly well known in Spain, starting out as a local radio host in the 70s before producing over 130 albums and then eventually becoming the director of a shortlist of saucy films with increasingly explicit titles, progressing from Swingers in Front of the Sea to Cum Shots for Joy. What? This video is brought to you by Sheath. It's underwear with a special pocket for your and balls. More about them in a bit, but if you're thinking, mmm, I need underwear, just let me move my beard out of my mouth. Ah, uh, that has a pocket of my chicken balls, because that sounds fantastic. There's a link below! This video is the incredible times people beat the casino. Do people really beat the casino? I feel like if you're gonna beat the casino, they're gonna beat you up in a back alley. Maybe that's just in movies. Although, I feel like that's more if you're stealing from the casino. Then they're gonna be like, oi! <laughs> Step out back and then beat your face in. I don't know why he sounds like a rough British person, because whenever I imagine casinos, I imagine Las Vegas. Anyway, what are we talking about? Daddy writes me a script. I'm going to read it. Sam is going to sprinkle in some of the finest vintage memes. Let's just get into it. So many gamblers spend years of their life trying to come up with a killer new secret system that will beat the casino at its own game. But as the new eyes soul will tell you, the best system of all has been widely known about for hundreds of years. Oh, it has, Danny. Has it? And it's quite brilliantly effective, boasting an impressive 100% success. I know what it's going to be. It's going to be like, don't go to the f casino. <laughs> That's how you win, because otherwise they will win. I mean, you might go in and win, but eventually they will win. It's statistics. Yeah, don't go into a bloody casino, just keep on walking. They can't fleece all of your money if you don't step through the thresholds and exchange your hard-earned dollars for chips. As soon as you do that, you've already given away the only advantage that you had, and now you're at the mercy of a madhouse of games, which have all been cunningly designed to favor the casino's pockets over your own. There's nothing cunning about it. They're just like, let's just give us a little edge. You know, let's let people win some of the time, but the majority of the time, we're gonna win. I just, I don't understand gambling. I don't understand casino. It's like, for me, it's like you go in and you give them, you got $100 and they take like $20. It's just maths, isn't it? I mean, sure you could win big, but you probably won't. Of course, every gambler is already acutely aware of this. It's not as if the house edge is a big secret. It's a vital component of the business model. <laughs> you imagine you just, just weren't aware of this. You're like, really? Where, oh, oh, that's how they afford all of this stuff. Ah, ah. But it still doesn't stop gamblers from taking their chances in table games where the cards are mathematically stacked against even the best player, or even worse, on the big slots where the chances of winning the top prize can be as high as 1 in 34 million. And at that point, just play the lottery. Don't do that. Don't play the lottery. It's a tax on poor people. Please just stop. No. No, I don't think I will. Um, and the longer you stay in the casino, the more likely you are to become the victim of mathematics as you try and win back those initial unlucky losses that end up draining your bank account dry. Thankfully, the majority of punters are only interested in a fun night out anyway, so they're unlikely to get dragged into a spiral of addiction and debt. But there are people who do. And it's not impossible to have a surprise big win at the casino even when the odds are stacked against you. An overly celebrated jackpot win is also good for business and another vital component of the model. But wouldn't it be handy if you could just make a regular a habit of winning every single time you walk through those doors. It'd be handy until I can't remember what other video I covered this in, but it was like, yo, 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 listen, if you keep winning in a casino, eventually the casino are just going to be like, you're not welcome here anymore. They don't have to prove anything. You can't be like, you're impringing on my freedom to gamble. There's none of that. It's a private gambling or it's a private business establishment. If they don't want to serve you, they don't have to. You can't be like, you know, it's not like discrimination. It's just that you're too good. And we don't want you playing it anymore. And you have to leave. And you know what you're gonna, you have to do? You have to leave. It's simple. You, 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 fuck off out fuck of here. Fuck me. Get out. Hey, excuse me, madam. Pressure. Fuck me. How about fuck you? Instead of hearing about the very rare jackpot wins involving lucky Mrs. Badger and chippings, uh, involving lucky Mrs. Badger from chipping sobri. Surely it can't be done. Nobody can beat the system. Or maybe some people really can take on the casino and win every time. There's a dude, I hope we hear about it, I made a video about it elsewhere, about a dude who invented some machine that you just attach to slot machines, or like it does something with the thing, and he's just like, bingo, and it like wins like the vast majority of the time. And he scammed the casinos, that's so much money. It was so good. But that's cheating. There's no genuine system. 
I mean, card counting, but isn't that also cheating? I'm not talking about the gamblers who like to bend the rules ever so slightly, or to put it another way, cheat. There's not so much pride to be found in the sledgehammer tactics of Tommy Glenn Carmichael and his armory of monkey paws and light ones and scoundrel sticks. Ah, it was our business plays that we talked about Tommy Carmichael now remembering with his magical gambling stick that it did with the slot machines. I'm talking about those gamblers who managed to beat the system without technically doing anything illegal at all. I wonder if we're going to be talking about, and I realize I just spoil everything ahead of time, and I should talk about it at the end if we don't bring it up, but I forget. And it's these guys who came up, it was quite a brilliant system, where they'd go watch a tennis, tennis match or something like that. Something will happen, like the ball will land out, and there'll be a guy at the tennis watching it. And he'd see the ball is out, and before the umpire could put it into his system, He'd have a mobile phone chat. He'd have a mobile phone going with his friend who's sitting at a computer elsewhere, and he'd say, it's out. And so he'd bet on the point that it was out, and of course it's going to be out, but it just takes the time for him to tell his mate is quicker than the time for the linesman to make the call, the umpire to look at it, put it in the system, and then it to be updated online. It was quicker for him to do it like calling his friend and making the bet online. And I'm like, that is genius. But now, of course, they're going to close the gap on that system, mate, because you made a YouTube video about it, and a lot of people are going to be pissed off. <laughs> the Godfather. One of the earliest and most legendary examples of a player fighting back against unfair odds involved a guy who was never even particularly interested in gambling. He wasn't even very interested in fleecing the casinos or making pots of money very easily. He just enjoyed solving mathematical problems. Oh, these are the best ones. Whereas, like, some genius mathematician actually figures out a way. Mwah! Back in the 1950s, 60s, Edward O. Thorpe was a mathematics professor with a master's degree in physics and a PhD in mathematics. And if there is some dude who is going to figure out the mathematical system, it's the guy with this sort of education. The only way it could be better is if it turns, it's like, yeah, yeah, he first studied at Oxford and then he went to MIT. You're like, oh, you're f***ing nice. You need to hire this guy to prevent guys like him. And the reality is they will because, you know, he's got more money, who's got less money than the casinos educational establishments. He was the kind of guy who knew the total cost of all the items in his shopping basket before the cashier had even started scanning the barcodes, but not the kind of guy you'd expect to see frittering away good money down at the dodgy Viper Casino, which is a brilliant name for a casino, Danny. If you made that up, I think you've got a career in naming casinos, to be honest. In fact, he'd never even thought to set foot inside a casino until his good buddy Claude Shannon treated Professor Ed and his wife to a night out on the Las Vegas Strip. Ed wasn't bothered about the slots or the poker table or the roulette wheel. But he did become fascinated by the blackjack table. He began to speculate that there might be a way for a truly skillful and gifted player to gain an advantage over the house. Wait, is this guy the first card counter? That would be cool. When he got back to university, at which he taught, he started hogging the facility's IBM 704 computer in order to carry out his research. This was one of those proper old-school computers that took up the entire bloody room and yet was less powerful than the phone in your pocket today. Yet 1960s mainframe? Way less powerful than the phone in your pocket today. Because we've been saying, like, yeah, they went to the moon. Uh, with less computing power at NASA than you've got in your mobile phone. I feel like we had that when I was a kid. And my mobile phone when I was a kid could play Snake. My mobile phone today, it's like, dude, this could play GTA San Andreas. It could do that like five years ago. Today it can pro I don't know what it can play, but it's amazing. And before he could even get started, Ed had to teach himself the early computer language known as Fortran. But he was a clever guy, so he probably had that part cracked over a quick lunch break. He then got to work on simulating literally billions of blackjack hands to get a deeper understanding of the mathematics and logic and probabilities at the heart of the card game. And he discovered something quite interesting. In a nutshell, he created a card counting system legends, which counted for the positive variations in the cards that remained in the deck after a certain hand had been dealt. Ed realized that higher value cards were more advantageous to the player, while smaller value cards were more advantageous to the dealer. So when higher value cards had been dealt out, the advantage in the remaining pack favored the dealer, and when the lower cards had been dealt out, this advantage shifted over to the player and was a cue to start putting down bigger stakes. By using his mighty brain to keep track of the cards that had been dealt and figure out all the possible variations in the remaining cards, Ed calculated that the player could gain up to a 5% edge over the house. That doesn't sound like much, but over time, that's going to crush the house. 
Like, their, their advantage is probably smaller normally. Once the godfather of card counting had perfected his new system, he hit the casinos in Las Vegas and Reno, Lake Tahoe, with his accomplice, Manny Kimmel, a professional and very wealthy professional gambler with alleged strong links to the mafia. Oh, shit. And over the next few weeks, they started to clean up, often picking up the equivalent of around $70,000 in today's money in a single night. That is a good business! It's nothing personal, Jack. It's just good business. Uh, but the problem, eventually the casinos are going to be like, get the f*** up, though. You know, we don't know how you're cheating or cheap beating us, but we know you are, so you're banned. The casino management clearly weren't happy, but they couldn't understand how Ed and Manny were pulling it off, as there was no evidence of cheating and no comprehension at the time of card counting. Ed was naturally asked not to return to the casinos that he had begun to frequent simply because he was winning too much. But he was to become something of a celebrity figure when he finally revealed his, cut, revealed his card counting system in his best-selling 1962 book entitled Beat the Dealer, which has since sold to close to a million copies and is now regarded as a modern classic. This is one of those very rare situations, because normally, if some guy, we mentioned it before here on Business Place, look, if some guy's selling you some system, if he's being like, I can make you a millionaire through the art of forex trading you just all you have to do is purchase my course for like 97 dollars be very very skeptical because if that guy could do like millions of dollars for forex trading why is he selling you the course why is he trying to get you for 97 dollars it's a very good question however in this case this guy had a system and he did write a book about it and sell it so that whole thing that kind of shoots my argument in the foot but This guy wasn't really interested in money. The guy who's flogging you the Forex course because he's standing in front of a Lamborghini, guess what? He is interested in money and he doesn't have a PhD in mathematics. I promise. If he has a PhD in mathematics, he's shutting the f up and doing his Forex thing at some giant hedge fund somewhere and he's very rich and he doesn't care about you. If you think about this, it was quite a dangerous thing to do, though some of the ruthless casino owners aren't going to, weren't going to be too thrilled about the idea of some boffin professor guy revealing to the world how to win pots of money at the blackjack table. They should be f***ing pleased that he published a book about it and didn't quietly tell a few genius friends to go and, like, absolutely destroy the casinos. They should be like, mate, you did us a huge favor. Let's work out how we can sort out the system so you can't card count anymore. And sure enough, during the early 60s, while Ed was visiting the casinos that he hadn't been banned from, he was once generally offered two poison cups of coffee by the management, but Ed could thankfully smell a rat before consuming too much of it. Holy sh**, they tried to kill him? Good lord! Allegedly. On another occasion, he got in a car to drive home for a casino, only to find that his accelerator pedal was locked hard to the floor and the brakes had completely gone. A situation that he only survived by the skin of his teeth. Oh my god, casinos are scary. Is that a mafia? Why is this mafia, friends? Why don't you manny? Come on, kill a few people. Take care of the people who make you know. Come on. Those casino owners probably shouldn't have gotten quite so grumpy, though, because in a way, Ed's book helped them pull in loads more revenue. The problem with Ed's card counting systems is that you still need to be pretty smart to pull them off. So successfully, and not everybody has a PhD in mathematics. Yeah, I'd say most people don't. In fact, I'd say at least, at least 50% of people don't have a PhD in mathematics. So whilst the book led to a new wave of eager gamblers who felt they could beat the system, the truth is that most of them only succeeded in generating even bigger profits for the casinos. Yeah, yeah, I can card count. <laughs> oh, I got destroyed. <laughs> The management should have given Ed a gold-plated Rolex watch instead of trying to kill him. <laughs> Just a gold-plated... they even make gold-plated Rolexes? I feel like if it's gold with a Rolex, it's gold. <laughs> It's not clear exactly how much Ed won on his brief gambling spree. The figure is probably in the hundreds of thousands, but nowhere near as high as it could have been. And that's just because Ed grew a bit bored of it all. He had solved the mathematical problem, and now he felt that playing blackjack had just become a routine grind, so he packed in the game. Dude, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> if there was a routine grind that made me 70 grand a day... Um, let's just say I, I, I'd be like, okay, yeah, no, I have to go out and gamble every night, but I'm getting paid $70,000. I think I'd be okay with that. I mean, that's so much money that you'd be like, am I committing crimes? <laughs> Plenty of others followed in the Godfather's footsteps, including most notably the MIT Blackjack team, an ever-fluctuating group of students and ex-students from the Massachusetts Institute of Research and MIT, okay? Okay. And Harvard University managed to rake. Is that what the film, I think that might be what the film 21 is based on. It's based on this story. It's a great movie. Great soundtrack as well, if I remember right. 
He managed to rake in an estimated $57 million from counting cards between 1979 and 1999 before the heat from the casinos finally got too much to continue. It's actually much harder these days to adopt a winning strategy with card counting anyway, as the casinos eventually figured out a cunning counterattack. They've just started shuffling the cards long before they reach of the end reach the end of the deck genius yeah i mean how hard can this be you're the casino you make the rules and look if everyone is if every card counts just just every casino would just start shuffling the deck people are not going to go to the one specific casino that doesn't and if they do that casino is going to get destroyed and so they're going to be like yeah we're shuffling our decks too look with the casino we make the rules there's no like blackjack google page that we go to and it tells you how blackjack has to be played no the casinos make the rules. They're the casinos. They're in charge. You is smart. As for Professor Ed, he turned his attention to the stock market and reaped a massive fortune from securities and hedge funds. Still going strong today at the age of 84, he's now believed to have a personal net worth of around $800 million. Good lord, my dude. No wonder you gave it up. You were like, pfft. Beating the casino 70 grand a night. Child's play. Let's play a real game. The stock market, baby. And now he's worth nearly a billion dollars. Legend. He's <laughs> fucking down in there! I'm rich. He made another intriguingly accurate prediction as recently as 2020. Well before the national authorities had recognized the COVID virus as a national emergency, Ed stocked up on vital supplies and advised his family and friends to go into self-isolation. He declared that the U.S. death toll from the virus over the following 12 months would be somewhere between 200 and 500,000 people. Almost exactly a year after making the prediction, the U.S. death toll from the pandemic passed the $500,000 uh, $500, mark for the first time. Dude, if you've got a Twitter account, I'm going to start following you because clearly you're a genius. Dude, I mean, you're a genius already. You had a PhD in mathematics from wherever you went to university. But also, you're like a double, triple genius or whatever you want to call it. You've got a big brain. <laughs> and you know what other big brains do? They get today's glorious sponsor, Sheath. That's right, legends. This video is brought to you by Sheath. <laughs> no, I haven't worn these yet. These are fresh out of the packet. I actually, they sent me a whole bunch and then I realized I didn't have any here because they're all like at home and I'm not wearing them today because I only have three pairs and I don't do laundry that often. Um, but then I found a new fresh one in the, in the box, which is probably preferable anyway, to be honest. I'm just filling time here while I bring up the copy with the talking points that I have to read. Could you tell? So basically, these boxer shorts were invented, or underwear, or whatever you want to call them, because kind of boxer briefs and all of that kind of nonsense, tighty whities or whatever you want to wear, is they all kind of suck. And everyone knows this, like I don't like the tight ones because they end up just squashing everything in and it gets all sweaty and horrible. So I wear generally like loose boxes. But the problem is they also have their problems because they'll, they'll ride up, they'll get all into weird places, sleeping them's a bit of a nightmare because you wake up and you've got some crazy ass thong wedgie going on. It's not a good time. So what Sheath did is they basically reinvented underwear. And let me show you how it works. You put your ding dong through this little hole. Wait, oh actually these are inside out. The ding dong hole is on the wrong side. Boom! I don't know why they come inside out, but uh, what we do is we just flip that the right way. So uh, you put these on, you put your balls in here, like they rest in... I know this is a bit weird, isn't it? It's a bit weird, but I feel much less weird talking about this than when I first did it, because I've just got used to wearing these, and I'm like, yeah, this is just better. <laughs> so you put your balls in there, you put your dick through this massive hole, because they know you support sheath. No, it's a, it's a, it's a normal size penis hole. What? And then uh, you put your penis in the front bit, and uh, yeah, your cock and balls stay away from your legs. It's not all sweaty, it's just super comfortable. They actually say here that it feels weird for the first few days as you get used to it. Honestly, I just put it on and I was like, no, I like this. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess you do have to get used to it, but I was like, no, I see why this works. It's good. How innovative. I like it. They call it an inverted kangaroo pouch. I call it a ball and dick holder. <laughs> Balls and dick holder. Generally, people have two. Simon, stop cancer shaming. It's like, no, no, no. It's like, I don't care how many balls you got. <laughs> it's all right. What? Uh, they were invented by a US Army soldier. Oh, yeah, he was off in Iraq. Is it, was it Iraq? Yeah, it was Iraq. Second tour in Iraq. Legends. Um, uh, it, dude, it's hot in Iraq. I've never been. I never want to go. <laughs> it's like fighting in wars. Oh, my gosh. I'd suck at this. And, uh, yeah, he was like, it's super hot. This isn't so nice. And I'm like... It's not even super, it's not super hot like Iraq here. It's the middle of summer, so it pretty, it is pretty hot. 
but it helps there. The best thing to do is just to experience this, and the best way to do that is with my special code, Blaze. So just go to sheathunderwear.com forward slash Blaze, and you'll get 20% off, and your dick and balls will thank you. They will. It's really good. Sheathunderwear.com forward slash Blaze, you get 20% off. Just try it, and then you'll end up buying like 17 pairs because you don't do laundry very often and you don't want to have any other underwear ever again. Sheathunderwear.com forward slash blaze. It's all in the wrist. Ever since the days of ancient Egypt, sneaky gamblers have been tampering with dice in a bit to ensure the right numbers are rolled every time. And any die that is not perfectly a cube would not behave according to the usual mathematical odds. And the Egyptians often used to shave off some of the corners to make the crooked die a bit more likely to land on the heavier sides. But what if you could roll the right numbers without using loaded dice and without breaking any rules? What if you could just become skilled at throwing dice? No, I mean, don't they have it? Like, isn't the one where you roll the dice is craps, right? Never played it. But you roll the dice and they have to hit the back wall, at least is how I've seen it in every movie, and then they bounce off. There's no fing way you can do that. I just don't believe it. The. No. One American guy reckons that this is perfectly possible, and he goes by the name of Dominic Larigio, although he's known in some circles as the Dominator and the man with the golden arm. He came up with a method of controlled shooting during the 90s and noughties, which he reckons has pulled in thousands and thousands of dollars from the unlucky casinos that he visited with his legendary dice rolling talents. All of this sounds like he says he can do this, and it's not really proved, allegedly. Just to be clear, Dominic wasn't claiming that he could roll a specific score every time, as that would clearly be insane. But he reckoned that his system reduced the odds of rolling a certain small set of combinations, let's just say any combination adding up to the number 7, and this came in very useful when playing a game of craps and attempting to make a long chain of successive dice rolls without 7ing out. And 7 is the most likely roll of 2 dice. When you're rolling dice in craps, the only requirement is that your dice hit the back wall big brain at the table before settling down into their final position. Dominic's controlled shooting involved holding the dice in a certain way, gripping them with precision, and tossing them in a manner which meant that they stayed closely together in the air before gently brushing against the back wall and landing as softly as possible on the table. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand, bitch. I don't understand. If you spend years mastering this technique, you can naturally gain more control over the rotation of the dice, minimizing the random spinning, and reducing the odds of throwing a seven. Okay, I get that, because then it's like you squeeze them like nice and tight together, and you just tap them against the back, in like a specific position, you tap them against the back wall, and then they land. But that's gonna look mad suspicious, because in the casino movies, they're always like, whoa, whoa, yeah, because they've had like 17 drinks now, whoa, yeah. So, I mean, they're just gonna be like, get the f out. <laughs> Like, we, we don't like you, Dice Boy, Golden Arm Dominator. Get the f*** out of our casino. Dominic fine-tuned his technique as part of a team of gamblers known as Rosebud, who first hit Las Vegas in the, in the 90s. But he eventually fell out with the team over their namby-pamby policy of sticking to conservative betting and avoiding detection. Stuff that Dominic wanted to win the jackpot. I mean, dude, you're going to get detected because you're going to be like... Against the back wall. He later teamed up with famous gambler and writer Frank Scobletti, and the dynamic duo claimed to have pulled in thousands of dollars from casinos all over the world with their expert dice stroking. Now, it's worth pointing out that many people dismiss the whole concept of controlled shooting as just a load of craps. Butter bum bum! But it's been suggested by expert gamblers that it's simply impossible to exercise any degree of control over the dice after they've hit the back wall, and which is usually textured and with raised pyramids. As some, and some might conclude that this is all just a scam, which today helps the man with the golden arm run his own thriving courses and seminars. Surprise! Motherfucker. Which are often priced around $1,500 a pop. Dude, dude. If the system was so good it doesn't break any rules, then wouldn't Dominic just keep on hitting the casinos instead of hosting wildly expensive training courses which claim to help other gamblers find their fortune with rhythmic rolling? Yeah, dude, but the, the previous guy wrote a book about card counting. <laughs> so this argument is somehow discounted even though it's obviously a correct argument. <laughs> Shit. Well, I'm not suggesting that controlled shooting definitely works, but there could be a couple of reasons for Dominic's departure from the casinos. For starters, he's officially banned from many of them, including every single casino in Mississippi. Although he's claimed in the past that he still used to frequent these casinos under the cunning disguise of a homeless man or a tattooed biker. 
he rarely finds it worth the effort these days, though. Maybe he just needed a better disguise to avoid suspicion. Uh, is a homeless man really likely to put down a few thousand dollars on the craps? Well, maybe that's why he's homeless, Danny. He now claims that if I can't play, I want my students to beat the hell out of them. It's worth bearing in mind that even though controlled shooting is not technically breaking any rules, a casino can still insist that the player throws the dice using different mechan mechanics if they smell something fishy. Yeah, of course they can be. They can ask you to do whatever you want. It's a private establishment. So I'm not entirely sure if Dominic's class is worth the money if the creepy A can just tell the students to stop pissing about or ban them in the exact same way that they banned the Dominator himself. But ultimately, there's no denying that both Dominic and his former partner, Frank Scabletti, have been witnessed in casinos on multiple occasions, rolling incredibly lengthy three runs at the craps table before sevening out and both their names pop up regularly in unofficial world record lists. So it's hard to dismiss the whole concept of precision shooting out of hand. However, neither of them have beaten the top world record set by New Jersey grandmother Patricia DeMauro in Atlantic City. We've talked about Patricia and how her 154 roll lucky streak was largely put down to beginner's luck at the time. Maybe she was secretly just showing the man with the golden arm how a proper rhythmic roller goes about her business. Yeah, I mean 150 rolls with 150 four rolls out of seven. I don't know what the stats are of that, but it is going to be fantastically small. The man who took Las Vegas to the cleaners. Any truly skilled roulette player knows that the best strategy to raking in a win from the wheel is to rely completely on the hope that your lucky number might come up at some point. It might sound like a bit of a rubbish strategy, but the odds of picking the right single number are pretty much set in stone at 1 in 37, so it's as good as any other. And any physicist will tell you that it's impossible to make any sort of reasonable or logical prediction with a roulette wheel as the speed of the ball and the spin of the wheel and the friction that re of the rebounds all, creative, all create conclusively chaotic conditions, damn you, why? Which can't be calculated with any of the, with any of capacity, uh, oh my god. They just can't do it, Danny, why'd you have to use so many C's and torture me? Oh no, we've become so smart, they're stupid to us. Quorum he, Vitio Morianis. What if you could read the wheel? As silly as it sounds, the study of wheel bias has been around ever since the Englishman Joseph Jagger began examining the casino's wheels in close detail back in 1880. Damn. The idea is that every roulette wheel is completely unique, and some of the wheels, particularly the older ones have seen, that have seen plenty of active service, are likely to develop certain aberrations through wear and tear and deformations and bulges. In fact, even brand new wheels are likely to have distinctive features such as tiny differences in pocket sizes, flaws in the wheels, gears, flexibility in the separator plates, and minor configuration problems with the balance. And all of this can lead to certain numbers on each wheel becoming prized hotspots, in which the ball is likely to land a bit more frequently than others. So for example, you can figure out that the numbers 17 and 32 are both positioned within so-called valleys of the wheel, You can so you can increase your odds of winning by just betting big stakes on those two numbers every time. I don't understand. I don't understand. It might seem a bit far fetched, or at least still very unfavorable to the player. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It'd be like, okay, so there's a tiny advantage, but the casino has a whole f slot or two, depending on where you are, um, which are green. So you lose every time. And that's a much bigger advantage than number 17 being, you know, it's a bit bigger because there's a one micron difference with the little divider thing. But a number of people have tried the system over the years, including German-born physician Richard Jaretsky, who is alleged to have picked up over a million dollars from the system in European casinos throughout the 1960s. He was described by the casino directors as a menace to every casino in Europe, and they were probably quite relieved that he eventually grew bored of winning in 1973 and went on to pursue a new career in commodities. I love it that the two, like, genius physicist guys who beat the casino just decided to quit and pursue careers in commodities in the stock market because they were like that's where the real money is isn't it let's just go do that let's just apply my genius to something else but he's probably and, and then he died worth 17 trillion dollars it's just crazy but perhaps the most famous and most dedicated exploiter of wheel bias was the spanish guy gonzalo garcia Pelayo, who by the 1990s had the benefit of computer technology to aid his studies into bent wheels gonzalo was already fairly well known in spain starting out as a local radio host in the 70s before producing over 130 albums and then eventually becoming the director of a short list of saucy films with increasingly explicit titles, progressing from Swingers in Front of the Sea to Cum Shots for Joy. What? <laughs> he took up his career a notch, didn't he? <laughs>
When he turned his attention to the casino, he came to the conclusion that no human was ever capable of producing a completely perfect roulette wheel. His original question of how many imperfect wheels are there quickly evolved into how imperfect are all the roulette wheels out there. Gonzalo decided to devote the next few months of his life into studying roulette wheels in the Casino Gran Madrid, and he even roped in his wife and five kids into watching the wheels. The whole family would spend literally hours every night watching every spin of every wheel in the casino and secretly recording over 30,000 results in total. Are they going to really find a correlation? It would really surprise me if it's going to be something more than like a few percent, because you've got to beat the house odds, which are a few percent. So it's really got to be a significant difference. Then Gonzalo created his own computer program in the simple QBasic language to accurately analyze these results and produce lists of the most frequently at numbers on each wheel. He concluded that he had managed to transform a 2.6% casino edge into a 15% edge which favored the player. God damn, that is exactly what I'm talking about. When he finally felt confident that he'd got his sums right, he dragged his whole family down to the Casino Grand Madrid to actually start betting on the hot numbers instead of just watching the wheels go by. They had a few false starts and lost the equivalent of a few thousand dollars along the way. But after a while, it seemed that the family's research was beginning to pay off in big ways. Just a few months later, they'd managed to rack up over $100,000 in profits by just spending six nights a week down at the casino and betting on their favorite numbers. That's pretty epic. <laughs> you can make that much money in five seconds. And of course, it didn't take long for the management of Casino Gran Madrid to start twitching their noses in suspicion. But the problem was that they couldn't tell how Gonzalo's family were doing it. Yeah, the only reason he's staying there is because they want to figure it out. Like, they'd just be like, yeah, get out. Like, we've talked about it so many times. The private said, get, get out, get out. But they just probably want to know how he's doing it. So he's just, they're just going to watch him figure it out, and if they can't, eventually they'll ban him. They tried randomly switching the roulette wheels around to confuse the family, but by this time each family member recognized every wheel just by the sight of the dent or dents or imperfections, regardless of which table it had been placed upon. That's pretty solid dedication. Also, you've spent hours staring at a wheel. You'd be like, I, I know it. You just, you just would know all about it. When the casino eventually figured out that Gonzalo was practicing the ancient art of wheel bias, the owners actually tried to sue the family on the grounds that they had been playing with an advantage. My dude, <laughs> they should count to you for playing with an advantage. You're the casino. <laughs> what an idiot! Oh, what a loser! Violating Article 31 of Casino Regulations, which empowers the owners to invite those who commit irregularities in the practice of games to leave the room. Okay, so they have to leave. That doesn't mean you could sue them. You, you don't write the law, casino. <laughs> It seems that only the casino is legally entitled to playing with an advantage. Uh, no, that's just their rules. That's casino regulations. Or unless that is actually a rule and it's not their own casino regulations, but the regulations that apply to casinos. I don't... That is a very flimsy legal case right there. Unless I'm really missing something, I don't think that's going to work. Or perhaps not, as after years of legal wrangling, the Superior Court of Justice of Madrid issued a ruling in 2004 which declared that Gonzalo was innocent of any crime, as he had made use of ingenuity in the application of computer technique. That's all. Got him right. How did it take so long to figure that out? By this time, though, Gonzalo and his family had already grown too big for the Casino Grand Madrid, and they had been busy taking the whole of Las Vegas to the cleanest. Legends. In fact, they went on to travel around the casinos of the world, although their reputation often preceded them. They were banned from casinos before they even got a foot in the door, and at one point they were even threatened with a gun when they tried to get past the security guard of a casino in Copenhagen. Just don't get, don't, don't try that. Don't try and push your way in. He's a security guard. What are they going to do? You get past him and you get inside and be like, now we're free to gamble because I got past the security guard. This isn't a computer game. They're just going to be other security guards telling you to get the f*** out. And even if there aren't, the dealers are going to be like, I've been told not to play with you. <laughs> Sorry. Still, they managed to rake in about $1.5 million from the roulette wheels of the world before Gonzalo strangely lost faith in his own system. During a gambling session in Las Vegas, Gonzalo had been betting heavily on two hot numbers, 8 and 31, which were positioned on either side of what he believed to be the infrequent number 19. He couldn't quite believe his eyes when the ball settled on the allegedly infrequent number 19 not once, not twice, but three times in a row making a complete mockery of his wheel buyer system, except it doesn't, because he's been playing for years and thousands of throws. Eventually, something crazy unlikely like that is going to happen. It was at this moment that he knew he fucked up. It's the statistics that you're exploiting, just expressing themselves in a different way. Come on, man. Gonzalo reportedly collapsed on the casino floor in despair and later revealed in a radio interview that he felt like a bullfighter who had been mauled in the ring and was now afraid to face the bull again. He later turned his attention to online poker and even returned to filmmaking after a hiatus of 35 years, so there's still hope for us patiently waiting for cum shots of joy too. <laughs>
<laughs> it's possibly much harder now to take advantage of wheel bias in a modern casino as the wheels are more sophisticated these days and some are even built in with rim sensors which instantly detect the slightest flaw or imperfection but some still claim that humans can't invent a perfect roulette wheel and some of the lower end casinos may still be using older roulette wheels which are ripe for your exploitation if you can be bothered just be sure to take a pen and several thousands to pay before you fully commit to your first gamble and book a few months off work <laughs> don't do that it's it's not gonna work out or better still just take my original advice to keep on walking right past the casino there might be a nice bakery or cheesecake factory at the end of the strip yes indeed and this has been an episode of business blaze thank you so much for watching thanks sheath for oh almost got stuck on my microphone up there different microphones for different recordings thank you sheath link below if you'd like to pick up this shirt i heart generic bald youtubers save yourself some money and buy the merch that represents all of us uh perch the merch.co thanks again for watching so there's still hope for us patiently waiting for come shots of joy too. <laughs>